Welcome to The Metabolic Link, a podcast that explores the common thread of metabolism in health and disease. This is where science meets society. Welcome to The Metabolic Link. I'm your host, Dom D'Agostino, and today we're interviewing Dr. Tommy Wood. I am super excited to interview him. I've been looking forward to this interview. Uh, Tommy has an extensive background in academia and, and also in clinical medicine. Uh, he did, he completed his biochemistry degree at the University of Cambridge. He did his medical degree at Oxford, and then he went on to do a PhD in physiology and neuroscience at the University of Oslo. So currently he is an assistant professor at the University of Washington with a research focus on treating injury in the developing brain. His research spans on improving human health, uh, human performance optimization, and longevity. We cover a lot of ground in this interview. Uh, I'm excited to share it with you. I think we hit on a lot of interesting topics that are informative and educational, and I hope you share this content with others too. Thank you. So Tommy, thank you so much for being on. Uh, we have Dr. Tommy Wood here, and he is really uh, leading, spearheading a lot of the understanding of brain health as it relates to not only the neonate, but to aging and dementia and Alzheimer's. And we're going to cover a lot of ground here, but, but for people who are unfamiliar with your work, can you give us a brief history about, you know, your career trajectory and what led you to your current focus on what you're doing now? Sure. So uh, thanks so much uh, for having me. It's a, a huge uh, pleasure to be, to be here and having been a part of a metabolic health summit. It was one of the best conferences I've ever been to. You didn't pay Thank me you. to plug that, but it was it was great. <laughs> Appreciate um, that. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> so I uh, did most of my training uh, in in Europe, as people may be able yeah. to tell. Uh, but I'm currently an assistant professor of pediatrics and neuroscience at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, I did an undergraduate degree in biochemistry, then uh, did a medical degree, followed by a PhD in physiology and neuroscience. Um, and sort of my neuroscience academic career has kind of gone through neonatology, like you mentioned. So that was what my PhD focused on was trying to find ways to treat uh, brain injury in, in babies. And that's still the majority of, of my day job. I now run the neonatal neuroscience lab at the University of Washington. And we look at ways to treat both babies who are born preterm, who are at very high risk of uh, neurodevelopmental impairment, uh, but then also babies who get to full term and you know something happens around childbirth or you know some other issue that maybe wasn't detected in advance and then we have to uh, uh, treat their their brain injury as best we can um but throughout that entire time I was also very interested in athletic performance um I was an athlete myself uh in college I was a rower um and have also dabbled in crossfit and powerlifting and strongman and ultra endurance uh events um and during my PhD, and then also when I was a postdoc, I, I, I worked with a company um, working with athletes, uh, trying to improve their performance, both like their health, uh, overall health, as well as their the longevity of their performance. So lots of people wanted to be performing well, you know, decades into the future, not just one season at a time. Um, and I still do some work with athletes. I, I mainly work with Formula One drivers uh, right now, as well as you know some other some other athletes here and there. Um, as a as a performance consultant, um, and as these sort of like two disparate streams of work were happening uh, over time, I kind of found what was really interesting to me was that the things that are important for long term health uh, and performance, be that cognitive or, or physical, are also very similar to the things that you need in order to best support brain development and health in the first place. In both you know a normal infant as well as, well as an infant who's at risk for for brain injury and so you kind of see these threads that um kind of tie across the entire lifespan uh both for physical and, and cognitive health and so that's really where i've started to focus is trying to better understand the brain across the entire lifespan uh including what happens in the middle so there's the yeah. kind of the beginning and there's the end with cognitive decline but i also work with some groups uh high risk for traumatic brain injury um and i and i have a traumatic brain injury model in the lab that i work with um and so you know how do those things uh, interact and intersect and to sort of tell you about your brain across your entire life well that that's awesome that's such a unique combination of academic 
you know, background with the biochemistry, the double doctor, MD, PhD, but with a focus on physiology and neuroscience. And, you know, I was trained by a physiologist and, and my PhD program was physiology and neuroscience too. So I, I really think, you know, having that physiology background allows you to put things into context mm-hmm. and allows you to understand things uh, from a, a more of a broad perspective that otherwise you would not know if you had just majored in like molecular biology or biochemistry or something like that. So there's uh, something about traditional yeah. neuroscience, which is very, it's very deep and not yes. very broad. And yeah, yeah. You, you specialize in like one cell in one model in one of one disease. Uh, and you don't I, talk to anybody else who works in any other thing related to the brain. Um, and I, I think that kind of holds us back a little bit. I know, I know, you know, I did my PhD really specifically on patch clamp electrophysiology, mm-hmm. and you might know what that is. And I, you know, really specialize in something called whole cell perforated patch, where you put nice statin in the pipette and it punches, you know, holes in the membrane, you gain electro. And it was like looking at that one cell. Right. But then we went yeah. from, you know, single neurons to like tissues, to whole animals kind of thing. And then now we're doing human research, but yeah, I, I can kind of totally relate. And so that coupled with your experience, you know, consulting and things like that, is just kind of an, an amazing background and, and, uh, and it makes you very unique kind of in your field. So I, I would like you to share some insights into your your latest research publications and a few. Well, uh, well, we were both before I talk about the one I want you to talk about. Uh, we were both co-authors on an editorial that addressed the need for research on lean mass hyper responders, and I'd like to revisit that later. But before we do that, uh, I've been very interested in this topic of the the significant health consequences of inactivity as it relates to physical inactivity leading to sarcopenia leading to, and then the decrease in muscle mass leading to uh, impaired, you know, cognitive function, but you approached it in a review. And I, I'm sorry, I just had read the abstract because it's on my desktop. I ha- haven't read it, but essentially it was discussing this uh, demand theory where if, if I'm not mistaken, it's just the, the putting cognitive demands on yourself or that lack of, you know, putting cognitive demands can, can contribute to cognitive decline. And, and that is very, very underappreciated. And I'd like for you to talk about some insights there. Sure. So, so that's, you're right. That's, that's exactly the, the, the premise of the paper and this model that uh, myself and Dr. Josh Turkner, who's a, a neurologist ha- have put together is this idea that, we know there are lots of things that contribute to cognitive decline and what we might call age-related dementia or late-onset Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so like not the genetic familial early-onset Alzheimer's disease, but the sort of long-term cognitive decline and dementia that I think most people are concerned about and that covers most uh, dementias that, that we're starting to see a, a, a rise in, uh, in, the last, in the last few decades. Um, there are lots of things that contribute to that. However, if you think about the function of a tissue and throughout the paper, we actually refer to muscle and exercise because actually there's a huge amount of overlap in terms of how those uh, tissues respond to what we'll call demand or stimulus. Um, that that seems to be the, the primary driver. Um, and then lots of other things uh, sort of play into that. So, so say for ex so if we take it back to exercise uh, to compare if you want to get bigger and stronger the most important thing is m- muscular tension r- lifting weights in the gym some kind of resistance training right we know we can improve the response by making sure we recover properly you know sleep nutrition uh adequate protein um th- those kinds of things so there are all these other bits that support the response to to the stimulus but it's really the stimulus that that's the primary thing so if you if you had the perfect diet and the perfect sleep and everything else was absolutely great but you never went to the gym you're not going to get stronger right and yeah. in in many respects the brain seems to be the same so yeah. if you want to improve cognitive function you need to stimulate a response and it's that's usually around skill development of, of some kind um and I'd take it back to the neonates because that's something that I'm very familiar with. You know, we think about how does 
a newborn or a toddler, you know, th those first few years, how do they how do they develop skills? Um, and they sort of continuously push the boundaries of what they're currently capable of. And that could be motor skills, right? Trying to stand, trying to walk, trying to climb a tree. But it's also language skills. It's also uh, social skills. And they'll push the boundaries and they'll fail and they'll try again and they'll fail again. But they'll slowly get better. And then they need some period of sleep and recovery. They sleep a lot to recover. Yeah. And that's when you get your consolidation and your plasticity. Yeah development of new connections and this is something that we stop doing as adults um, because we don't like being bad at things and we get better at doing the same things again and again and again um, and then you sort of one of the best examples of this is there are several population studies that show as soon as you retire your cognitive yeah. your cognitive um, function uh, starts to decrease and that, and that's the most precipitous drop off because you've lost yeah. your main you've lost your main stimulus. Yeah. So there are multiple different ways that we can compare the brain to exercise, but I think people um, people understand the muscle and exercise, but essentially the brain is exactly the same. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I, and some people have jobs too that just are not cognitively demanding. They're just mm -hmm. very mundane jobs. And I mean, even in academia, I mean, some days it's just like, you know, what one day I just do a lot of paperwork and it's just even teaching, you're teaching the same subjects all the time. Uh, it can be a little bit mundane. So it's really mm -hmm. important to have you know, actionable lifestyle interventions, you know, that uh, enhance, you know, uh, that put you out of your comfort zone, I guess, uh, that that are, uh, you know, in, in rodent research, we have things in our cages that are novel environment, you know, so yep. creating that novel environment, environmental enrichment, I think it's called, mm -hmm. um, yeah. to enhance learning and memory and things like that. But I think, you know, from what you're saying, it's really important to have hobbies and, you um, things outside of work. Well, work plus coupled with hobbies, because if you retire, uh, you know, you're going to have to fall back on things that are cognitively stimulating. And for me, I mean, I've been kind of uh, last couple of years, like farming, and that's like, I was rebuilding a hydraulic fluid line. And I, I jumped to, I jumped to YouTube to figure out how to, you know, replace a particular gasket or something like that. So it's very stimulating, but it's, and my wife, on the other hand, she's not so much into physical activity, but like dancing, I guess that dancing is, but that's like, kind of like, she will argue because she's trying to get me to dance <laughs> more, but uh, she'll argue that that's the perfect synergy of like physical activity. And then there's like a cognitive, but then there's a social aspect and she's, she's from Europe and she would bring me to Budapest and show me like uh, different, you know, work these salsa dancing and all these different dances are and the people are like 70 some of them 80 years old and they just looked so cognitively sharp and especially when they're dancing it's like they get into this other mode so i actually think that could be like a really long good longevity exercise uh and then so we, we actually we i'm going to take the side of your your wife here because we, we, yeah. we do cover <laughs> this in the paper oh, no. that oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> from the studies that exist dancing is probably the best single mode of physical activity uh, the, as it as it pertains to cognitive function, so they've they've done studies where uh, they have they randomize people to either do a dance intervention or like a circuit training intervention that has the same sort of cardiovascular load, right? So you're doing the same yeah. amount of physical work, but in the in the dancing, you have uh, obviously the coordination component, you have the social component, and then if they do MRI scans of the brain, you get a greater increase in size uh, or and con connectivity in the hippocampus in the dancing group compared to uh, the, the the resistance or circuit training group. Um, and there's actually several studies on dancing, particularly in, in older individuals. And it seems to be associated with improved both brain structure and function. And probably because it ticks so many boxes, social yeah. movement, coordination. And, th and there are other... Um, there are other meta-analyses of uh, different types of activity and how they relate to cognitive decline prevention. And those that have a coordination component uh, seem to be the most protective. Um, uh -huh. And there are, so there could be uh, ball skills uh, or you know, ball yeah. sports. Uh, there, are, there are studies on uh, like badminton uh, seems to have yeah. more of an effect compared to like cycling of, of, a, of a, you know, that's similarly strenuous. So that coordination component seems to be really important. That's very interesting. Yeah. You know, uh, 
Yeah, but but you also have to be like I have no problem with dan- dan- dancing. It's just it it does take me out of my comfort zone because mm. I've never yeah. been. Uh, so the other question is that like you know what when I'm I'm very engaged in something and it's kind of new and it's like uh, an intense stimulus, uh, uh, then then you turn you tend to learn it faster, right? So if you're not like fully embracing it and you don't get that dopamine hit. Mm. Uh, will dancing then enhance, but I guess it's like anything, once you start something new, get out of your comfort zone and get better at it, the more you do it, the better you get, the more engaged you get. Um, so I've been doing some ice bath things. So we have like a, a sauna or like hot tub and then I jump and I have like a, a cow a trough that I, I bought for like a hundred bucks and a, a couple of metal pans that are like six, seven gallons and I freeze them in my freezer. And I, and I did ice bath and I was listening to you and somebody talk about coffee or whatever and the effects of, co- I think it was uh, Paul Saladino or whatever, oh, yeah. but I remember like exactly what you, I just listened to it the other night and I can, I jumped in the ice bath and I was listening to it during the ice bath and I can remember almost like verbatim on that. Cause I'm just, I made my coffee here and I'm drinking it. And I, I think that helped like consolidate. I was excited to, you know, start this ice bath protocol that I mm. wrote out and everything. So that, that, kind of comes up to the question it's like i think we learn best and we maybe can consolidate memories better if we couple a particular thing with um with an activity that's engaging perhaps releases dopamine activates the sympathetic nervous system uh no doubt that dancing could do that i think i'm going to put dancing on my list for 2023 and my wife will be so happy about that (laughs) But, uh, but I just need to, I just need to find a way to make it a little bit more exciting and engagement, you know, have more engagement, but maybe that'll happen as you, the, the fulfillment you get, as you get better at something, I think is maybe tied in with that. And I don't know if you've looked into that too. Yeah, it's a good point. And I I think you're right. There's a, there's a certain amount of engagement or almost, I think you could call it a type of stress that is associated with the most like plasticity and and drive for change in the brain. And and I think there's, you know, uh, there's um, evolutionary aspects to that, right? Because if something has, you know, greater importance and it sort of activates, you know, activates sympathetic nervous system and and, and other aspects, you know, you're more alert during it then yeah. there's, there's a greater drive for change. And it's, you you know, sort of historically, it's to do with survival. Um, yeah. But there's this, I think there's an element of frustration and failure, like being just like being right on the edge of what you're currently capable that that drives that sort of ne- neuroendocrine milieu that's that's most associated with driving plasticity, because you, you probably yeah. need to be, there needs to be either you're very excited to do it, like you mentioned, yeah. or there's that slight element of frustration because you're right at the edge of your current skills. Um, and so then the important thing is, um, well, I think there's some potential benefit there because you can say, well, if I want to develop a new skill, you can just pick something that you're excited about, something you're excited to learn that will help. Uh, but equally, um, as you do something and you get better at it, you just need to make sure that you keep sort of pushing that boundary because I think if you get to a point where you're comfortable it's no longer the same the same stimulus and you're also not generating that generating that same sort of environment that that drives change yeah well speaking about driving something just popped into my head I don't I don't know why but well maybe because you're talking about you're a consultant for uh f1 drivers that's that's awesome uh but when I was when I first got my license and there was no gps Right. So I remember driving to, for example, New York City and we lived in, in you know, mid central New Jersey and the and just looking at a map and doing that and just being super hyper vigilant, like driving and just just the memory of, you know, looking at the map and just kind of like that. But now we kind of outsource everything to GPS. Right. So we get in our cars uh, we outsource whatever. We don't have to look anything up. We just ask Siri or we, you know, uh, Google or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I know it's like use it or lose it. And I was, I was kind of doing some fall cleaning, I guess you would say, and came across my calculus book and was like, how did I ever do this? Like, I can't do this now. <laughs> if you gave me a calculus test, I would fail like every question. So is modern technology 
kind of making us dumber in this regard uh, or just, I mean, it's just a thought that popped into my head and I think it, it ties into what we're talking about here. Yeah. I've, I've thought about this a few times and I think yes, yes and no. So yes to some of those previous skills that maybe we had to have. Um, and, you know, maybe a thousand years ago, it was uh, tracking and understanding the environment so that you can, so you can hunt yeah. an animal. And then more recently, it's reading a map so you can get where you want to go, yeah. um, either you know on sea or on land or in a car. Um, so I, th I think we are losing those skills. But I, but I also think that we're getting stimulus and skills in in other arenas. So when I think about myself and I think about remembering just inf information, there's so much more information yeah. available yeah. to everybody now than there was previously. And, I, 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 you know, I'm not a memory champion and there's no way mm -hmm. that I'm going to be able to remember all of it. So I've noticed in myself that I, I've changed the way that I remember things. So I no longer remember the exact details of every study and every paper, for instance, right, for my academic work. Yeah. But I, I remember enough about each individual paper so that I can go and access it again, right? So it's it's kind of like the difference between knowing a book from you know front to back versus knowing where things are in the library. And, and I think there's... You know, th there's a similar, you know, potential benefit of of both, but we've had to change tack just because of the, the amount of information available. Yeah, and you're prioritizing what you need to know. Maybe allocating more space on your hard drive or whatever <laughs> for that too. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting. Yeah, but I just thought like you know, a lot of people just wouldn't know how to use a map or get to yeah. get. And I know there was. Uh, I remember reading something or watching something on TV about this, these London taxi drivers that had oh, yeah. like, you know, a lot of neuronal connections because having to learn the crazy streets and everything in London or whatever. But, uh, and, and I kind of think of that in regards to how, how we're outsourcing, you know, that, that's one of my, everywhere. that's one of my favorite all time, all time oh, studies. Yeah. So I got to talk about it now. So, so oh, this yeah, is, yeah. Um, looking at, uh, potential drivers as they learned what's called the knowledge so you had to learn the knowledge in order to be allowed to be a, a taxi driver in london it's not the case anymore but it was oh, okay. historic uh -huh. yeah. and the knowledge is memorizing the map of twenty five thousand streets in a six mile radius around charing cross station in the center of london and they took individuals and they 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 had did MRI scans uh, before they started training, and then it's a two year process to learn the knowledge on average. And then they did MRI scans after, and they had a control group. And then they looked at the hippocampi, and they had some yeah. measure of um, like hippocampal. It was like a quality rather than a volume thing. It was like a, an intensity measure. And they looked at those who passed the exam, those who failed the exam, and then the controls. And those who passed the exam saw an improvement in this metric that they had on the MRI scans. And then those who failed and the control group saw no change in two years. So this wow. like intense focus on memory had this very specific effect on changing the structure of the brain. Um, and it's just like, it's, it's, I mean, oh, it's that amazing, amazing that people could memorize all of that. Yeah. I think I saw it on like 2020 and then people reference it from here and there. Uh, that is fast. So do you know what percentage of people passed that test? I mean, oh, this is like, this question. is like I can't, harder I can't than the MCAT. That. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, that is very interesting, uh, man. I mean, this is like such a, a cool topic. I want to ask because, you know, trained as a neuroscientist, I have a lot of interest in memory. I, we're going to come back to that, but I, but before, before we do, and uh, I want to kind of hit on, uh, biomarkers of metabolic health. And, and I guess you could say uh, longevity biomarkers in particular, you know, which ones you think are, are really important. And over the years in reading more about kind of what you just said, and also about strength and muscle mass and brain function, I think we should focus too on strength biomarkers mm -hmm. as we age. And I did a whole sort of audit of myself and now I'm tracking these things and graphing it and everything just for myself. I've always been a very, uh, religious kind of, uh, journaler and note taker and started getting uh, blood work at an early age and tracking these things. So, um, you know, it, you know, there's blood pressure, but there's also blood 
blood related biomarkers. And then, so maybe uh, your thoughts on what are the most important ones. Uh, I'd like to talk about insulin. It's not measured. It's not part of the standard test and also ApoB, mm -hmm. uh, which are things that I've been hyper-focused on, but also strength and maybe some functional biomarkers and the importance and relevance of that with aging. So the strength related ones, we can start uh, there. Uh, there are I mean, several studies in, in several large uh, population uh, cohorts that show that strength is one of the best predictors of mortality. Uh, and probably the the two best, you know, the two best predictors of, of mortality are strength and aerobic function or VO2 max yeah, or some, max, some version yeah. of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so having adequate strength certainly seems to be you know, critically important. And this is where I think muscle really comes into it. And having done some of these analyses myself using some of these population data sets, what it really seems is that so we know muscle is also a, a good muscle mass is a good predictor of of longevity, particularly, but it's not that like more is better. It's mainly that having low muscle mass is associated with increased mortality. And when you get more when you get more muscle mass, what um where it seems like the effect, the mediation effect, like what's the what's the effect that this muscle mass is having? Most of the benefit seems to be coming through increased strength, which uh, I sort of extrapolate to increased function. So yeah. it's better to have more muscle, but only if that's functional, useful muscle, like just having more muscle for the sake of it doesn't seem to be, doesn't seem to be beneficial. Yeah. So then this, this is a really important topic. I think, I mean, cause you carry a lot of muscle mass Yeah, you know, I saw you MHA, and, <laughs> and, and I, I mean, I'm kind of, I was pretty heavy, you know, throughout when I was really into lifting and eating like 500 grams of protein a day. And I shed some weight because I think, and I'd like to get your opinion on this eating six times a day, four or 500 grams of protein training, like an animal powerlifting. You know, I, I did not think that was a good longevity strategy because what you need to do, and it really not so much the training, but the amount of calories and protein and food you have to consume to maintain that is putting a lot of stress on your organ systems, you know? So, uh, my strategy, and I'd like to get your take on this is to maintain as much strength as functional strength as possible with the least amount of calories. That's what I've been doing and, and trying to, um, technically, you know, I'm still overweight, but, uh, but I, I believe that, that it's not hurting me now because uh, the amount of food. So there's, you know, and everybody's different because everybody has a preset, you know, metabolism or, and if you've trained when you're younger and you built a lot of mass, obviously it takes a lot less to maintain it now, but this is a question I get a lot and I get tagged on like social media about this. And, you know, that's dangerous to hold that amount or to be that strong to lift. You have to have too much muscle and the things you need to do to hold that, whether it be not, I'm not even talking about hormone optimization, like steroids and things like that. I'm just talking about just natural, just from a dietary perspective. So, so what's your thoughts on, you know, a, a male who's over 200 pounds versus one that's maybe would would that same male be more optimal at a strong 170 pounds in regards to like you know 220 pounds i mean is is the same male so you have genetic twins so you have two twins and one's 170 one's 220 and they train but the guys who's 220 is just consuming a massive amount of food to maintain that in that twin study, <laughs> it, you know, with the guy, with the one that's 175, 170, 175, but still, still trains with the same level of intensity, is he going to have a longevity advantage? So if we assume that their like cardiovascular function is identical for their body weight, right? So their VO2 max yes. is scaled to yep. mass, right? So let's yep. say that that's identical. The study needs to be done. I think, yeah. you know, we need to have a twin study where we do this and, and, you know, where they have, yeah, comparable VO2 max, training, uh, they eat the same base diet, but just obviously the guy, the twin who's 220 needs to consume a far more and maybe train a little bit more on the, the, the powerlifting spectrum. Yeah. So there's, I, I guess we'll kind of like zoom out before we zoom in. So, so there, there are some studies and, and this has been highlighted by some, because some you're that 220 guy. 
yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. And, and so okay. obviously I'm going to view it through, through, yeah. through my lens and I'm, I'm going to be uh, ter terribly biased, although I'll try yeah. not to be. Okay. Um, so th there are some studies that suggest that having high muscle mass has the potential to be detrimental, particularly for cardiovascular disease outcomes. And again, these are population observational studies, right? They're not randomized controlled trials because we just don't, we, ca we can't really do that. Yeah. Um, so the, the longevity advantage for muscle mass seems to be when you're above like the 50th percentile. So you're like in the top 50% to one third of, of people in the population. And so if you look at, and this is in the average population. And if you look at the average population, you think, well, that's probably not that much muscle mass and it's not that much strength, right? That's where, the, and then above that point, more is not better, and maybe there's a signal of of a downside if you have a lot more muscle mass. Mm -hmm. the The problem with this, and this is a problem that I actually I talked about um, briefly in in my talk at, at MHS uh, this year, is that in the general population, more muscle mass correlates with more fat mass, and it correlates with just being bigger overall. So in the average population, you're not putting on a bunch of muscle mass because you're working hard in the gym. You're putting on more muscle mass because you're eating, you know, above caloric requirements and you're just gaining more mass in total. And so if you look at, say, NHANES data sets that are, yeah. represent the average population in the US, as muscle mass increases, fat mass increases and metabolic health gets worse. So there's this signal that says, hey, more muscle is worse, but it also comes with this whole bunch of other stuff, right? You can't isolate the muscle from other aspects of body composition and metabolic health because they're sort of perfectly correlated in a population that isn't really resistance training. They ask those questions and nobody's really lifting. So my, my real answer to your question is I don't know. And the reason why yeah. I don't know is because studies aren't done on people yeah. like you and me we don't exist people like us don't exist in those data sets so i can't tell you like i i could take a guess i think the effect is probably pretty minimal in the setting of good metabolic health good diet good sleep all that other kind of stuff i'm not particularly worried about it um but equally yeah if you're sort of pushing the boundaries of caloric consumption and, and at one point you're eating four or five hundred grams of protein i mean that's a pretty heroic protein intake um yeah. I could definitely say right, you're right on the edge of being an outlier. So, you know, th there's potential for harm there. And I understand yeah. why you've made the changes that you've made. But equally, I, I would I would say for a lot of this, we don't really know. And we're just kind of like, whatever makes you feel good. And if you make sure that the muscle mass that you have, you know, is functional, right? And yeah. you've gained it for a, for a reason, it sort of, you know, makes you more stable and stronger and all those kinds of things, then I'm probably not as concerned about sort of like the, the total amount of it. Yeah. So, okay. That's really great insight. Uh, and I think it, it kind of, and, and also you have to view it from the context. Like if you trained a lot when you were younger, uh, same thing as like, if you were a long distance, you know, track and field athlete or, uh, you know, when you're younger and you built a very good, uh, cardiovascular base, VO2 max, yeah. like it's easier to, to maintain that. Yeah. Uh, but, I, but I think, and this is a transition into, uh, the blood-based biomarkers. So insulin, ApoB, A1C, uric acid, I'd like to get your kind of take on, on these things. Uh, but also, also like to just get a general CBC, CMP, uh, I do like this longevity profile that looks at, you know, IGF one, all the hormones and things like that. I uh, just started doing that like once a year, the last couple of years, so my thoughts are that if you are, you know, holding that amount of mass and you're looking at, and you're doing a very comprehensive blood work and your blood biomarkers of metabolic health, probably blood pressure too, is a super important one. Mm -hmm. You know, if yeah. you're, uh, I, I just know that, you know, eating a lot, when I gain weight, I can see it in my blood pressure. When I lose weight, I see it. My blood pressure actually gets too low. If I had to like fast and get below a certain amount to to get to, to weigh in prior to getting like life insurance. Cause I tried to sneak in below and like my blood pressure is like, I had like orthostatic hypotension. I fast uh -huh. for a couple of days to sneak in. Um, but I, but I think we really need to rely longitudinally on a number of biomarkers to, to guide us. And, uh, and I think that becomes sort of, uh, an important thing to, to guide us, but I'd like to get your take on, and this, 
Uh, maybe we'll save the ApoB for last because I have some questions and that could transition us into maybe discussing a little bit of the lean mass hyperresponder mm -hmm. because yeah. I think people listening to us may fall into that camp, but you know, blood pl pressure, which is often overlooked because in metabolic health, you know, I, I think blood pressure is almost the most important glycemic control. I wear a continuous glucose monitor. It's kind of boring because I'm keto low carb, <laughs> but uh, I'd like to get a little bit of, you know, some of your insights into, it. I did notice, I'd like to add real quick that when I was eating that amount of protein, when I was younger, my liver enzymes tracked high, like thirties mm -hmm. and even approach forties. So, and I started getting blood work at a young age cause I was on a drug Accutane for, for acne. So it's like, I started when I was like in 1992 and then I thought it might've been elevated because of that, but then I got off of it. And for years later, I was eating massive amounts, just sitting on my ass, studying, you know, training, just like you probably, you know, in school, that's, you just don't have time to do anything other yeah. than just like study, eat and train. Uh, and I always had high liver enzymes, but not, it, it was within range, but now they're half of what they used to be like in the teens even. So, uh, yeah, just enough talking about me. So just some insights into some of these, uh, these biomarkers that you think are really important for looking at longitudinally. So for, for the liver enzymes, because you mentioned it, there's there's probably two components to that. I think if you're eating a very high protein diet, you will upregulate ALT and AST, yep. particularly ALT, to help turn that protein into glucose, right? Because you yep. that's where a majority of your calories are coming from. So in, in order to convert, you know, be part of the alanine cycle and convert your protein to yeah. glucose, those will go up. So that make that does make sense. Um, I'm not necessarily sure that's a bad thing um, because in most populations, liver enzymes are actually very poor predictors of longevity. They've looked at it, doesn't really seem to make as much of a difference as, as some people make it out to be. Um, but then the other one is is training. So um, very strenuous training. We know that that increases, again, liver enzymes, and it can be for several days. So you know, if somebody's really concerned about their liver enzymes and they and they come back high, I'll often have to make sure they don't uh, you know, do any hard exercise for several days before they they do a retest of, of their blood test. So both of those could, could be playing a role. Um, I have done a whole bunch of you know very expensive and extensive testing in, in a wide range uh, of people. Um, and over time, I've kind of paired back what I really tend to look at because they just seemed like there was a lot more noise than, than signal in, in, in some of the more in like fancy urine tests and maybe some of the, the slightly more niche blood tests. Um, but, you know, a, a CBC, you can get a huge amount of information from the number of red blood cells, their shape, their hemoglobin content will tell you uh, about um, nutrient status. It will tell you about, you know, potentially about uh, chronic inflammation, some other things going on. So I think that's really important. Uh, you know, particularly to so say we are, talking about people with uh, more muscle mass that does put your risk for uh, sleep apnea uh, so then if your hemoglobin is going up that that's that's often a signal that you you have some obstructive sleep apnea and that sort of becoming hypoxic is driving uh, red blood cells up so you can kind of see you can see a whole bunch including so white blood cells again you can tell a lot so the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio is correlated with metabolic health and um it yeah. was it's been a it's a risk marker for severe covid and other infections and some kind of some immune status so there's a whole so bunch of low levels there. so risk for covid would be low levels so it's a high right. neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio oh, so high neutrophil a, to lymphocyte yeah ratio. so high okay. neutrophils relative to lymphocytes so lower lymphocytes and a lower lymphocyte percentage uh that is it, that's probably uh that's probably where most of that signal comes from but also higher mm -hmm. neutrophils which is sort of like your acute um you yeah. know, sort of like a, a acute immune response and there's there is a nice um <clears throat> there's a nice metric that you can do with some of these basic tests which is like a a blood test based biological age called pheno age um uh -huh. which is again developed in nhanes and it actually uses percent of lymphocytes as part of as part of the predictor no age. Uh, okay so just so i understand it like if lymphocytes or uh neutrophils are elevated you know, in a higher level, that's a risk factor because your immune system is hyperactivated in some way and sort of preoccupied, right? And, it, and it'll impair your ability to uh, attack any incoming challenge or yeah. something like that. Right? Yeah. So okay. it's, 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 it's either some, it can be an, an acute, so neutrophils go up anytime, you know, as soon as you get sick or yeah. you get stressed, right? So it could be either acute or chronic stress, but then also the lower 
relative amount of lymphocytes, that's your like adaptive immune response. Yeah, that's your yeah. kind of, you're d- developing your ability to respond next time you get infected, that kind of stuff. So there's kind of multiple parts of that, of that signal in there, but it, it, that huh. seems to shift as your metabolic health worsens, your, your neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio goes up as, yeah. you know, HbA1c goes up as HOMA IR goes up, you know, those kinds of things. Okay. Um, uh... Yeah, very interesting. So I haven't probably need to analyze some of some of that. And I think, yeah, from you could probably garner a lot of insights into that. Someone sent me their blood work yesterday with low white blood cells across the board, but it was like borderline low and low neutrophils too. And so they're kind of concerned about that. I see that very commonly yeah. in healthy individuals, particularly in athletes. And it's not okay. something that it's not something that I worry about. Um that sort of borderline low neutrophils, I think part of the reason why it's borderline low and this this is a whole other part of blood tests is that yeah. the normal ranges are developed in normal people and the average population which make up those from which the normal range is generated is an average population in the US which means that on average they have at least one one chronic disease on average they're at least pre-diabetic on average they take at least one uh, long-term prescription medication and so i think that you know, if we talked about how neutrophils go up as metabolic health worsens, I think yeah. the the normal range is probably just a, a little high because that's the population that it was developed in. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Cause yeah, I've been trending kind of on the low end. Um, so some of the things that interestingly are not measured as part of like a comprehensive metabolic panel are uh, insulin. Uh, and this, this is a common, I teach at the medical college and it's just like uh, one of my, uh, the director did her whole PhD career, NIH funded in non-human primates on insulin uh, and, and very compelling work that insulin starts to go up prior to dysglycemia as, you know, Gerald Schulman and, and others have talked about this too. And I think you can catch type two diabetes well in advance, maybe even a decade in advance when you see this, you know, uh, creeping insulin levels creeping up independent of weight gain. Mm. So uh, maybe some, some thoughts about uh, insulin resistance. And later we might talk a little bit about how that ties in with Alzheimer's disease too, but, but your thoughts on, on those biomarkers and also like to get your thoughts on, uh, you know, A1C and and triglycerides and maybe uric acid too. So I'm sorry to jump in with like a very niche comment about neutrophils first that I forgot to mention. Um, have in in some of the, the, it's kind of, been talked about in some circles and i've double checked it in some of the data that i've had access to and it does seem to be the case neutrophils can be slightly lower if you have inadequate copper intake and that can be driven by zinc intake so i've seen again in athletes they take a bunch of zinc because they think it's important for immunity zinc competes with copper for uptake and copper starts to decrease and then that can sometimes cluster with low neutrophils. So I think in most people, it's not an issue, but if yeah. you've been supplementing with a bunch of zinc, you take ZMA at night or you take zinc yeah. for immunity, yeah, that yeah. may be throwing your copper out of balance. So that okay. could be part of it. Um, That's interesting. I, I periodically took zinc, like if I had like a sniffles or something like that, or when I had, I just a very mild case of COVID. So, and I, and I took zinc, but I don't take it. I mean, I, it's very rich. And if you're eating meat and other, yeah. Yeah, other yeah. things, yeah. Um, okay. So then you know, insulin, measure, yeah. insulin like, and measures of glucose. Um, uh, and can, can your insulin be too low? So I've gotten several emails from people. Uh, actually it was flagged on my last blood work is like, you know, being too low or it's like 2.2 or something like that. Uh, so your thoughts on potentially insulin being too low and that could decrease glycolytic flux and then have some consequences associated with that, because it does seem to be a hallmark in uh, lean mass hyper responders, the low insulin. Yeah. And, and I think the low insulin is, is driving part of that. My, my, my personal hypothesis is that low insulin signaling, which is actually what also happens when you're very insulin resistant is you yep. get um, high uh, FOXO1 signaling, which then drives some of the production of lipoproteins in, in the liver. So I think that that's part of why we see that that picture. Um, but I, I don't I don't think, you know, as long as everything else looks good in isolation, low insulin doesn't concern me as long as it's not zero, right? Yeah. Because um, yeah. <laughs> then you would have type 1 diabetes. Um, but from the glycolytic flux standpoint, there's also, you know, part of it 
So if you're, if you're thinking about um, intense athletic performance, like that's when you might be, might be concerned about glycolytic flux. And yes, there's probably some of it that's um, substrate driven and insulin driven, but some of it is also, you know, a good chunk of it is also demand driven. So I think yeah. you can overcome some of that decrease in glycolytic flux uh, if you're on a very low carb or ketogenic diet just by doing high intensity work. So like you can change the demand side and, and maintain some of it. Um, yeah. But things like, you know, HbA1c seems to be a bit, uh, you know, important predictor of longevity. Um, I, in, you know, people I work with, I measure uh, fasting insulin, calculate a home IR. Um, you know, the alternative is C-peptide, which is a little bit less, yeah. uh, fluctuates less, you know, because it's sort of like a, an average of the insulin released over the, the previous 24 hours. And I, I think those are, those are nice, uh, nice markers. And we know that as, you know, yeah. uh, glucose homeostasis worsens as insulin resistance starts to kick in, insulin goes up, C-peptide goes up, you know, HbA1c is going up. Um, and things like HbA1c, I don't, I don't think they're useful in, in like a single point in time, unless they're sort of wildly elevated, because it's very individual from person to person what an HbA1c means. So, yeah. you know, they they like the the report will say your HbA1c is five point zero, which means that your average glucose is this. That's essentially meaningless because there's huge variability in the yeah. glucose, the average glucose that results in a given HbA1c in, in an individual. But tracking it over time. I think is 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 important. So if yeah, your yeah. HbA1c is creeping up over time, then you you probably know that your your sort of glucose fluctuations or your average glucose uh, is increasing, and that seems to be an important uh, predictor. So yeah, you know, alongside that, you mentioned triglycerides. So the triglyceride to HDL ratio seems to be an important again sort of correlates yeah. with with overall metabolic health, but it does depend a little bit on the person's ancestry. That's the the it's mm. most predictive in those of a northern European sort of you know in in white individuals essentially because that's the that's the um, population that it was developed in in the framing oh, and framing okay, frame yeah, studies. Yeah, okay. So yeah. when they've looked at uh, black individuals or mm. you know individuals of other ancestries, the triglyceride to HDL ratio is less predictive. It's less mm. useful. So it's just like knowing knowing the population you're working with uh, seems to be important. Yeah. Um, and so, so, you know, high triglycerides seem to track with both high carbohydrate intake as well as uh, poor metabolic health. So, yeah. so, so that can definitely be helpful too. Yeah. Trigs are a big one. I, I think, uh, I mean, you can, you can get a lot of information from seeing how trigs change, you know, and, and it tends to be, uh, if someone has a calorie surplus, you know, it goes up independent of diet really. Uh, but I've seen a lot of trigs come down when people switch to eating more fat. And I think that's, by virtue of creating a, a deficit to, uh, you yeah. know, that, that'll get your, your body's just more hungry. Uh, and, and I have a meter that measures uric acid from D uh, Dr. Perlmutter. And I've been tinkering with that and measuring that. And, and do you think uric acid is sort of something that's important that should be tracked? I went back and looked, I actually, surprisingly, it was on blood work back in the nineties and it was like 2.5, I think it was pretty low. Uh, but typically I run about four or uh, under certain conditions, I've been able to, it goes up to like six or seven if I'm eating a lot of fruit or organ meats and things like that. So do you think this is something that, that people should, should be tracking? To be perfectly honest, hmm. I, I'm not that convinced in uric acid uh, as yeah. a marker. And I think the context is, is much more important, right? We think about yeah. uric acid, we think about gout, which is also, yeah. you, yeah. Know, di you know, in the setting of chronic inflammation, poor metabolic health. And, you know, historically that kind of tracks with things like meat intake and fructose intake. And yes, you know, fructose does drive a majority of uric acid production as yeah. does, um, you know, eating sort of nucle uh, nuclear side or nucleotide rich foods. Yeah. Uh, like right? the carnivore diet. If you're like eating organ diet. meat and, yeah. and, and, and a lot of fruit, you know, it's, I, I ate a big liver, we eat liver a lot, I, you know, a lot of liver. And then I eat like, you know, a whole cup of berries and maybe last night I had like half a pomegranate and I didn't measure uric acid then, but I would, would think it would be elevated, but I mean, that is like some of the most nutrient dense food. And is that elevation, uh, noise or is it something relevant that that needs to be addressed so i i don't think it does personally okay as long as you know everything else is in check and you know yeah. there's some interesting um you know, if you look at the evolution 
of uricase and you know uh, of, of all the primates humans have much higher levels of uric acid and you know it's maybe related to uh, brain development and, and cognitive function um or at least in terms like evolutionarily at least and then equally it's uh it's an extracellular right it's your main one of your main circulating antioxidants antioxidants um, yes and uh -huh. so um me and 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 they kind of you know if you're having a, an attack of gout you know often your uric acid level will be normal or low and that's probably because you're having this big load of oxidative stress as part of it that's the, and hmm. uric acid is actually being used as, as an antioxidant oh i didn't so, know that so gout like an episode of gout having a gouty reaction would typically not show a spike in uric acid. It would be no, low not, not necessarily. Okay. And that's, oh, that's, that's something that, you know, often if somebody comes in, so I remember when I was working in, uh, working in hospital, when I was working as a doctor, you know, I had somebody come in and they had these amazing gouty tophi, which is where you sort of like yeah. the, the joints kind of like swell up and you have these weird uh, sort of fatty deposits in addition to like, the active joint reaction. And, you know, it's, it's just very frequently said that, you know, there's no point in testing uric acid because, it, it may be normal or even low. And, and that's, you know, the theory is that it's all been sort of drawn out of the blood in order to be deposited in the joints. But I think there's also a possibility that it could be you know, being part, taking part as an antioxidant and it's being used up. Yeah. So all that to say that, you know, without additional context, I, I don't think the uric acid is something that I'm particularly, you know, worried about. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, that that's good to know. Hey, you know, mine's been pretty much staying and, um, uh, you know, I've, I've made some changes in my diet too, that I, that I think have improved that, but ultimately I'm trying to really optimize glucose, insulin, triglycerides, uh, you know, uric acid and blood pressure, all these different things in the functional biomarker. Uh, but one thing that has shifted over the years, if I, if I do like a 30 year analysis of my blood work is a tripling or quadrupling, <laughs> uh, but I'm sure you get this a lot, uh, of, of LDL and, and also, uh, my ApoB is elevated, you know, pushing like 150 and, and also my LP little a is also, so I'd like to get, you know, ApoB, if people are listening to this, uh, is a better, atherogenic a marker of atherogenicity, you know, and the literature is pretty solid on that. And it, it is, um, it's sort of in a one-to-one -one ratio with a number of different, uh, lipoproteins, uh, apolipoprotein. It is apolipoprotein 100 is kind of like the name for that for ApoB, but it's in LDL, IDL, uh, uh, VLDL, uh, and LPA, I think, right. LPA it's kind and, of, and chylomicrons. Yeah. yeah. And chylomicrons too. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, um, kind of an analysis of the particle number, uh, versus like the mass of cholesterol, mm. you know, and, uh, and I do feel that, that this is important and this is something that I need to change. And I get many, many emails, uh, throughout the week of people who have this elevated in the context uh, and it's very context is very important. And I, I'm, I'm sure you'll talk about this, uh, have an appreciation for, for context for people who are, are not metabolically deranged. Uh, but the literature is just so solid on this. And I just tend to, to really follow people who have, you know, that the people who have published on this, I feel are kind of biased. Right. And I just go to like the literature. I know there's conflicting you know, thoughts on this, but the balance of the, the literature as it pertains to high impact peer reviewed publications and deep analysis of this would suggest that, that we should really, really be playing, paying attention to ApoB. So I would like Dr. Tommy Woods, uh, uh, thought thoughts on this, uh, and with, with an appreciation of context, which I know you'll add to this. So you're, you're absolutely right. APOB is a very important predictor of cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, cardiovascular deaths. Um, and there's, the, you know, there's a log linear relationship. They've looked at this in Mendelian randomization studies, which yep. basically says, you know, look across, you know, millions of people, all the different way their genetics interact, you know, changes your total APOB. And then you can look at how that correlates with cardiovascular disease. And, you know, there's a very clear relationship. So it's absolutely important. And there's a lot of people in our world who say that it's not, but, I think the you know the the burden of evidence is really on, on that side. Yep. 
However, I do agree that context is important. And I'll start by returning to the idea that what, what's the what's what's the health of the population in which these things are being assessed? And it's not very good. And I think in the setting of, you know, if we think about all the different parts of, you know, endothelial dysfunction, um, you know, interval hyperplasia sort of in the, the, the in the, you know, the, the carotid artery structure, which seems to precede some, you know, the development of atherosclerotic plaque, all of these things are related to overall and metabolic health. In a population where that's not good, then you know, you've already set the scene for plaque to be developed. Then yes, of course, APOB is going to be this uh, is going to be very strongly associated with cardiovascular disease. In somebody where that's not the case, which is now the minority, I think for the same level of APOB, everything that we know in terms of you know, so when they when they look at um, individual studies, both uh, data from the statin trials as well as you know population data sets. For the same level of ApoB, if you have lower fasting insulin or a lower triglyceride to HDL ratio, you have less cardiovascular disease risk. So we know there's an interaction between the level of your ApoB and your metabolic health. So mm-hmm. I don't think that risk goes to zero, right? In like pristine metabolic health, if you have very high ApoB, I still think your risk is higher than somebody with the same metabolic health with a, with a lower ApoB level. But you know, compared to the general population, I, I still, my guess is that your risk will be lower. Yeah. But I can't say that for sure because nobody's actually done a good study on that. And this is why we, you know, we we sort of co, we took part in this sort of editorial, this comment to say, yeah. there's a subset of people who are in great health. You know, they do, you know, they, a lot of them do a lot of physical activity. They have really good body composition, but they just happen to have high ApoB or LDL cholesterol, you know, and and sort of the traditional line of thinking would be like would say well all that matters is your ApoB these people are at high risk um, but I think there's enough yeah. evidence to say that's probably not the case and this is a this is a group of individuals though small um, that is worth studying uh, because it will tell us more about how these different parts of the system interact. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's definitely an important point, and we need you know long term longitudinal data uh, with various imaging technologies, including, you know, biomarker studies. The thing is, you know, I I get, and I'm kind of on this spectrum too. It's like, maybe my HDL doesn't fall into the lean mass hyper responder, you know, where it's not like a hundred, but it's, Mm. but it's like upper sixties. And, and some, I, I, I get a lot of emails from people daily that are really outside of the lean mass hyper responder, (laughs) Uh, crowd, but are uh, somewhere on the edge there. And my my thoughts are that I don't I don't think that uh, having very tight control of your glucose and insulin and other biomarkers is mutually exclusive to optimizing your lipid profile with yeah. an emphasis of ApoB. So it's not mutually exclusive. So I think there, and for me, you know, for better or for worse, that means you know, adding carbohydrates back into my diet, you know, is which, what I'm doing now. And I'm kind of tinkering with some things. And primarily it's, you know, I have a little bit, I have, uh, berries, uh, broccoli salads and, uh, and dark chocolate I have every day. And I've been adding pumpkin, like canned pumpkin. And I put some like sour cream and chocolate and make this like pumpkin pudding with blueberries and stuff at night. So yeah. And I like, I've been titrating it back in to get the fiber and seeing numbers move in the positive direction. Whereas, you know, all the other biomarkers, we talked about insulin and my insulin surprisingly goes down a little bit. If I add some, some fibrous carb- carbohydrates back in up until like the hundred grand, 150 gram range. So, so I don't think these things are mutually exclusive. And I think there are people following very strict ketogenic diets, thinking that's what you got to do. The only thing, the only consequence to that is that it, you're not in a state of ketosis. And, and I do believe that having beta hydroxybutyrate and other, you know, ketones elevated throughout the day, like right now I'm fasting, maybe about 14 hours in. And so maybe I'm starting to make some ketones now, but I do have some exogenous ketone here. So usually this is about when I get hungry and then I'll extend it another two, three hours. Uh, but I only intermittent fat, like maybe once or twice a week. So the more I, I'd lose weight if I do it too much. 
but uh, but but I think an important message here is that like you don't need to conform to these super very low carbohydrate ketogenic diets uh, because the science is not there yet. If you're concerned about it, you know it does not have to be. I think you can get the best of both worlds, and and, and I think maybe that's an important message that I have not talked about <laughs> that much, and I've kind of uh, said now nah, you, you know I, I've kind of ignored. I, was, I don't worry about it, but but I think I think. I'm speaking before the science is out there. And so, yeah, I don't know. I'm just echoing, I'm just rambling on, but I'm echoing basically what what you said. And in many ways I've tried to justify my own diet and lifestyle and things like that by saying this is potentially a non-issue. I'm not worried about it. Not necessarily telling people that they should not be worried about it, but but I think by virtue of telling people that I'm not worried about it, people people are like, well, if he doesn't worry. If Dom doesn't worry about it, then I'm not going to worry about it. But but I do think it is something that I've I am taking serious na- seriously now and actually doing proactive things to get all the biomarkers, mm-hmm. uh, including I mean LP little a. What's your thoughts on that? I don't. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm interesting. This, I'm very interested to see what my intervention's doing now, and where, when do you go into a pharmaceutical intervention? Whether that's a PSK9 inhibitor, a statin, a zetamide, a zeti, or whatever. So, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and it, certainly not like a real expert on this, and I don't deal with it on the yeah. the, the day to day but, either, it, but yeah. <laughs> um certainly have people come to me with with similar questions uh to you I, t- uh, first i think there are none there's a that's relevant to the lemas hyperresponder but just more like the physiology of this in general there's lots of evidence in low energy states apob and with that ldl cholesterol go up so there's, it was a nice study done a few days, uh, a few years ago, where they took individuals and they fasted them for eight days. The longer they fasted, the more APOB went up. Um, there are studies in uh, those who have uh, disordered eating and are chronically calorically restricted. They have higher LD, uh, LDL cholesterol. Uh, they've done similar studies in Army Rangers. Uh, there are studies yeah. uh, in Red S relative energy deficiency in sport. Um, when when that happens, LDL cholesterol seems to be higher. So it seems that in this sort of uh, it's probably because of the low insulin, a low insulin state in most people that's driven by low caloric intake in others. It may be due to just very low carbohydrate intake that seems to increase APOB. And I, I think, you know, I mentioned very briefly why I think, I think there's, there's reasons why that makes sense. Um, so that, I think that's interesting. That kind of tells us something about the physiology. And, you know, if on the one hand, somebody is saying that, you know, APOB is the be all end all and the other, and the other, and the other hand, they're saying, well, you should do extended fast for your health. Those things aren't don't necessarily make entire sense together, and I've I've said, but I've certainly heard people you know, take both of those stances at the same time. So I, yep. I just think that's interesting. I have no further comment on it other than it's interesting. Um, yeah. For, for other things, so LP little a, um, I think that's you know it's now what we might consider part of you know like the residual risk after you've managed your ApoB or your LDLC as much as you can. Because it, it does make up part of APOB, but it's not, you can't really manipulate LP little a with, uh, say, statins uh, or PS, PCSK9 inhibitors or azetamide as much as your LDL yeah. particles. Um, so I think it it does seem to be important for risk. Like once you take into account LDL particles, um, it seems to be more genetically yeah. uh, determined. But I've, I've also heard from people that... They've they've seen pretty big swings in the LP little a depending on you know on various uh, things that they do. Um, there are some potential interventions. They're not like great randomized controlled trials, but like carnitine intake, vitamin C intake, um, and astocysteine. Um, they seem to to maybe be associated with lower LP little a. So if somebody's like particularly worried about that, there's something they can they that, that they can that they can try out. Okay. Um, there's they're bringing in small interfering rna um so in like inhibitors of yeah. lp little a i think that's that's probably going to be those trials have been going that. for several years now that yeah, that's probably going to yeah. be on the market in two or three years would be my guess yeah. um when it when it comes to um sort of intervening i think if for whatever reason you're at elevated risk um, and that could be high coronary artery calcium score i would recommend people get a ct angiogram you know, as the gold standard yeah. if they're really concerned yeah. Um, you know, if you're, if you're at elevated risk, you know, from say from the number, I would 
do more digging i'd look at you know try and figure out how much active pathology you currently have going on in your arteries and yeah. you know if there's some combination like and it could be high genetic risk as well i think that's one of the areas where genetics are useful yeah. in health and there aren't many totally, um, yeah but then, but there are there's far fewer areas where g- genetics are really helpful currently than most people would tell you but there are some nice studies that show that if you have say monogenic causes of a high LDL cholesterol versus polygenic, like a high polygenic risk versus like just sporadic increases, not driven by genetics for the same level of LDLC, your risk is higher in that order. So if you have a high uh-huh. polygenic risk, um, then maybe you, maybe you'll, you'll take, you, you'll be a, a, you know, you'll have a lower threshold for doing a pharmaceutical intervention. I think that's kind of uh-huh. where the cutting edge is currently. Cause there's some good data, there's some good data, um, on that. Um, so, the, uh, so a combination, you're right. You, you have your lipid levels, uh, maybe, uh, you know, I would recommend people get some imaging, you know, you could you can add yeah. uh, a polygenic risk score on top if that if it's something you're really concerned about, and then depending on how those you know each of those uh, sort of come back, um, you would think about where's your where's your risk threshold for intervening, um, and 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 you know you mentioned multiple potential interventions, and then there's other options like you can do mm-hmm. uh, like the Boston Heart uh, uh, Cholesterol Balance Test, and you can figure yeah. out is your cholesterol coming from absorption versus production? Yeah. And then that yeah. might tell you, should I take a statin versus a zetamide or, you know, a combination of, of both at lower doses that can be beneficial too. So like lots of different parts at play, it, but you know, if it's something that people are concerned about, you're just getting a really good assessment of where your risk stands, I think can help. Yeah. Well, okay. So <clears throat> just a quick recap on uh, with specific focus on non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions and, and, are these are the pharmaceutical interventions uh, impacting it through LDL receptor upregulation? So, like greater clearance, you know. And, and then, so our I guess two questions. So, are pharmaceuticals working through that mechanism? And what are some potential non-pharmaceutical ways to maybe augment uh, LDL receptor upregulation? If if that is a viable way for clearance, because there's some some experts who really feel that that could be the case. Yeah. It's, uh, so PCSK9 inhibitors obviously work primarily by increasing clearance because they prevent yep. the internalization of the, of the LDL receptor. Um, statins were originally thought to decrease production, but may also uh, affect uh, receptor number uh, and uptake. Um, so there's probably a, a bit of both at play, say on, on, the, on the statin front. Um, the sort of non-pharmaceutical ways to increase LDL uh, receptor number, the, the easiest one is that, you know, assuming you're metabolically healthy, the easiest way is to increase insulin signaling. Uh, so yeah. eating, okay. more carbo- eating more carbohydrates. That's, that's uh, what I thought you were going to say, but I was curious. Yeah. So just yeah. adding some carbs back in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually do, I don't know if you'd call it like, uh, a biomarker specific intermittent intervention <laughs> where when I have to have blood tests that go on my record, then I, I make an intermittent dietary shift uh-huh. to basically, and it's very interesting that I can do that. And I know Dave Feldman did that too. So uh, yeah, I can, I can move that biomarker if I want to, but then I go back to my, my normal eating pattern, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, I don't tell my doctor this, but maybe they would know if they watch this, but, uh, but yeah, this is just something that you could do. And, 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 uh, it's just like, and it is, it basically adds validity to what you just mentioned, you know, just increase insulin, uh, activity. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to shift gears a little bit because it's a topic that I've also been very interested in. And I know you're kind of an expert and you spoke about this. Uh, okay. And I know you've been on a uh, podcast where they kind of demonize polyunsaturated fatty acids, but I, I don't know what I didn't, I have them linked into my Spotify, but I didn't like listen to them yet. But do you think PUFAs polyunsaturated fatty acids are a problem and, and also I kind of want to add to that, uh, a double question, environmental toxins, a problem too, because if that's the case, 
then eating fatty fish is like a double whammy, right? You're getting a big hit of polyunsaturated fatty acids and then, you know, heavy metals on top of this. So I was recently in a debate or podcast where, where this was presented to me, like mm-hmm. you should not eat fatty fish because PUFAs are really bad. And then on top of that, you're getting heavy metals. So there's like this synergistic, but like all the data is showing, you know, if you eat fish, like even with Alzheimer's disease, like, you know, it kind of correlates to the DHA levels or omega-3. So like to get your your thoughts on polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega six and omega threes, mm. and and also maybe a little your input opinion on heavy metals too, yeah. and the concern uh, if you eat, are eating fish. So yeah, uh, a huge ton to to unpack there. So I guess we can start by separating omega six from from omega three um, fatty acids to begin. So uh, talking about omega six, like seed oils, canola, soybean uh, oils, which make up a significant proportion of of the american diet um and that's increased dramatically in the last 50 or 60 years um i've changed my mind about this a little bit um or a lot um and so originally you know i was very much in the and and i'm thinking about general health and then maybe we'll, we'll go down a little bit into the into the brain stuff um sort of more broadly um, you know, I used to think that, you know, seed oils were terrible and they were doing all these terrible things in the body. When you look at the data that we have available, including like measuring the tissue levels of, of fatty acids of people and like the, the, the fats that are in your subcutaneous fat are the fats that you ate. Yeah. Um, so yeah. like it, it gives you a marker of like how much has this person actually eaten? There is no signal of increased mortality or cardiovascular disease. If anything, it's the opposite. The higher the omega-6 linoleic acid in your in your fat tissue, which means that you ate more of it, the lower your risk. Um, so I've 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 had to shift my and until a better study that maybe answers the question the way that some people uh say it needs to be answered. I'm I'm waiting yeah. for that study. I would, would love it to happen. Until that happens, um I, I've had to kind of ch- uh sort of change my mind on that. Um in with with respect to the brain in particular that there there is a lot of data in the like the developmental uh, neuroscience arena that says that very high omega-6 fatty acid intake uh can compete or alter or decrease the uptake of omega-3 fats into the brain and i think that is and getting enough dha into the brain is a critical part of brain development yeah so i i do think there's there's a there's a a space to say that omega-6 your very high omega-6 intakes um a may alter brain development and, and and brain function and you know they've done autopsy studies in babies who had a very high omega-6 intake uh due to formula milk yeah um and then you know they are very low dha uh in the brain and very high omega-6 and you know everything that i know about brain development tells me that's probably not a good thing um so so i, I but uh, times have changed now and you know like formula and other things yeah. have have improved um there's still you know, much higher uh, omega-6 content in breast milk than there was maybe 60 years ago again, because it's mm. coming from the diet. So I think there's, you know, I can't tell you anything uh, specific from that, but I think there's potential there um, for, to there to be an issue in the setting of inadequate omega-3 at, at least. In development. Um, yeah, everything's in de- in magnified a hundred times in development, whether yeah. you're talking about, you know, omega-6, omega-3 ratios or heavy metals or things like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess, you know, and then that question, are these things relevant? Uh, a big question, you know, are environmental toxins, is the omega-6, omega-3 ratio, is that super relevant in adult life and are some of these environmental toxins too. And, you know, you know, women, I, I bought, uh, the other day, last yesterday I ate mackerel and it has a very lengthy thing on the back of it. And I think it was like, maybe it references California or something too, but it was just like, uh, yeah, if you're, you know, I had to look up the source of the mackerel cause it, I've never seen it on a fish container before. Uh, of macro and it was like a lengthy paragraph about the heavy metals in this and don't eat it if you're pregnant and i was like oh that's the first time i saw that mm-hmm. so we would like to get maybe your take from a from a, a neonatal neuroscientist expert perspective and then but translating that to the adult population mm-hmm. too uh of course omega-3s are great for, for development but if you're delivering it in the context of of 
heavy metals, which I eat a massive amount of fish. And just for the record, you know, I got hair and blood heavy metals tested and they were low. They, mm -hmm. they were just like in normal range or low end of normal. So do you think that this is a potential problem? Because I get this question a lot. Yeah. So I think maybe, maybe just to finish off the, the omega-6 thing, yeah. uh, again, specifically for the brain, there, there's been some studies looking at oxidized linoleic acid metabolites. So like these oxidized versions of the omega-6, you know, long chain omega-6 that we're getting from these, you know, seed and bean oils. And they seem to be, you know, maybe elevate in this, in one study I'm thinking of, they, they were elevated in people with Alzheimer's disease compared to those who, who don't have Alzheimer's disease. And these uh, metabolites can affect like chronic neuroinflammation. It can affect again, DHA uptake into the brain. Yeah. Um, and they, they did an intervention where they reduced linoleic acid in the diet and these came down. Uh, similarly in animal studies, they've done the same thing. If you feed them a lot of linoleic acid, these oxalams go up, it interferes with DHA uptake into the brain. Um, we, the, it's interesting, and actually a colleague and I, Rory Heath, wrote a paper about this uh, a year or two ago, you know, asking like why, I and mean, we know DHA is really important for the brain, why, you know, when they've tried to intervene in cognitive decline, you know, the, the clinical trials don't really show much, you know, why is the sort of like the promise of DHA not really, you know, interventions really sort of changed the, what what happens in people with cognitive decline and there's just like so many moving parts there so sometimes if you look at uh, autopsy studies you look at uh, people who have cognitive decline versus those who didn't they may or may not have lower dha in the brain um i, I think a lot of it comes down to um you know context of other things what what's what's sort of happening in general in terms of metabolic health and other stuff um and then also the one really important thing that we focus on in this paper is that your fat tissue is like a it's like a depot it's like storage of of uh, dha and omega-3s and if you've sort of like intermittently eaten fish throughout your entire life you probably have enough and it's just kind of stored uh in your mm. fat tissue and then it will be like partitioned out as you need it so for most people if they've occasionally eaten fish they've probably get gotten enough um dha um another related thing um, you know, people will ask about like, well, if I take an omega-3 supplement, does it have to be like a, a fancy phospholipid form or something like that? Because you get more uptake into the brain. No, is the answer to that. Because when they look at sort of longer, so for a single dose, um, yes, if you take a phospholipid form versus a triglyceride form, which is how it comes in fish, more gets yeah. into the brain. But if you, if you take it for more than three days in a row, then they even out. And it's basically because huh. the triglyceride form goes to the adipose tissue first, and then it gets partitioned out oh, and okay. goes to the brain. So you don't need to worry. Yeah. About, you don't need to worry about the form. Okay. And when we cover, all, you know, if somebody's really interested in it, we cover all like the evidence of that uh, in, in the paper. Tommy, um, isn't the data, uh, you know, much much stronger on fish relative to supplements? And yes. Isn't, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And there's probably a whole bunch of other. So there's a whole bunch of other stuff that comes along for the ride. Yeah. which starts mm -hmm. to answer your, your heavy metal question. So in from the developmental standpoint, um, as far as I know, the, the two best cohort studies looking at this uh, were based in the UK and the Seychelles Islands, where they have eat a bunch of fish. And developmentally, um, outcomes are better in infants or, you know, either because they eat more fish or the infants of mothers who eat more fish, um, developmental outcomes are better. Despite a higher heavy metal intake. Um, and that's probably because most of the issues with uh, the organic mercury that you might get from fish um, is balanced out by the increased selenium intake, which helps you to, to sort of like counteract the effects of mercury. Yeah. Um, so yes, fish is better than a supplement, I think. And yes, fish intake may increase your heavy metal intake, particularly organic mercury. Obviously the risk is reduced if you eat like mackerel is probably the highest mercury content of the small fish or like sardines mm -hmm. are lower. Um, but that seems to be more than counteracted by the benefits um, uh, in terms, in terms of brain health. I, I wonder if they did a study just on people that eat swordfish, like what, <laughs> <laughs> what, you know, it's, I mean, I guess there's people probably out there in, in areas where fishing populations where they just focus on swordfish, but that would be really, or just, just to, yeah, just test or, tester levels. So yeah. I, I used to love swordfish, eat a lot of it when I was uh, younger, much younger before I knew about all this stuff, but yeah. So, so yeah, it's not, it's not something I, I don't eat a ton of like tuna and swordfish and stuff, uh, but I do eat a lot of fish and it's not something that 
uh, I've, I've seen no no evidence in the literature to suggest that it's something I should worry about. Okay, so that was heavy metals. But what about, uh, I don't want to go too far down this road, but environmental toxins as a whole, mm. uh, you know, I mean, I guess you could talk about like glyphosate or uh, polyphenol or, uh, you know, various plastic agents that leach into from drink. So, and it just kind of like, yes or no answer <laughs> to this. Do, do you think it, it, it is a problem? And, and if it's so, if, if you do think it's an emerging problem, do you think people should uh, get tested for this? For various yeah. So um, some of the like plasticizers, PFAs, like BPA, yeah, again, BPA. In, the, mm-hmm. in, the, in the developmental arena, higher intake of those does seem to be associated with worse neurodevelopmental outcomes in kids. Of course, um, there's a big uh, societal component to that that isn't always adequately adjusted for. So like people who have the highest intakes of those are also the people with the you know highest levels of discrimination and, you know, yeah. they, the, the for various other sort of socioeconomic reasons why that, why you may see that effect. So that, that has to be taken into account as well, but there does seem to be a, a signal there. Um, probably less so in adults though, after brain development has occurred. Okay. Um, one important so if we're thinking about um, both cardiovascular disease and it seems alzheimer's disease as well lead exposure certainly seems uh to be associated uh with with both of those uh there are some reasonable papers particularly on cardiovascular disease mm. and lead um a circulating lead um and that can come both from the water from pipes uh you know and there's also some residual lead in the atmosphere from you know um leaded, and petrol. leaded petrol back yeah. in, back in mm-hmm. the day um, so may, maybe worth, uh, maybe worth testing, uh, you know, at least yeah. once just, just to yeah. see, um, uh, related to that, like atmospheric pollution, particularly particulate pollution, like P- PM 2.5, which you get from like car pollution or uh, mm-hmm. transport pollution that seems mm-hmm. to be associated with an increased risk of say, both cardiovascular disease, as well as Alzheimer's disease and cognitive decline. What's interesting and actually relates to something I didn't mention earlier on the blood tests um one of the like most important things you can measure from a cognitive decline standpoint is homocysteine level um and if you have high mm. homocysteine you know there have been uh, randomized controlled studies that show that if you supplement with b vitamins so b6 uh, folate b12 uh, probably riboflavin as well you decrease homocysteine and that slows brain atrophy and slows cognitive decline so i would definitely recommend if people are worried about cognitive decline definitely recommend measuring homocysteine but there was a study that just came out from the University of Washington where they looked at an interaction between B vitamin status and atmospheric pollution exposure. And they saw that the detrimental effect of atmospheric pollution was only seen in those who had poor vitamin B status. So you can bolster your effect, you know, your, your resilience to some of these things uh, by just making sure you have a good nutrient status, um, which yeah. I think is is like, because some because you can't necessarily escape the pollution you're exposed to, but you can test the homocysteine level and take a B12 supplement if you need to. Yeah, it's a good equalizer, I guess yeah. you could say. Uh, okay, very good. Yeah, I didn't know that association with lead and Alzheimer's. So maybe I heard it, but I think that's the first time. There's more came on up cardiovascular conversation. disease, but there's a little bit on Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anything, I mean, this transitions us to talking about Alzheimer's a little bit. And I know we're coming up on time, but I just have like two more questions. Yeah. So, um, you know, so this kind of brings up uh, the etiology of Alzheimer's disease is. <laughs> I'd say at this point, largely unknown because, you know, there's a lot of questions around the amyloid hypothesis and the role of amyloid as being causative or like a downstream epi phenomenon, if you will, mm. of uh, neuroinflammation, metabolic impairment, you know, a decrease in, in various enzymatic activities associated with clearance and things like that. So I'd like to get your take on the etiology of Alzheimer's disease from the perspective of the amyloid hypothesis, and also maybe from the perspective too, any, we know that anything that's good for the heart is good for the brain, right? So yeah. cardiovascular health is intimately linked to brain health. And, uh, and I've heard it talked about uh, before in a recent lecture I went to that, uh, that mini strokes an accumulation of, of of, you know, mini micro strokes, I guess, if not even mini, but micro strokes, uh, pathophysiologically impairs 
the perfusion, cerebral perfusion, which it made me think that that could be, we know a hallmark characteristic of Alzheimer's disease is glucose hypometabolism. So in that way, it may not be necessarily the GLUT3 transporter or pyruvate dehydrogenase complex or, you know, uh, or other glycolytic pathways, but it could just be a perfusion issue. Mm. And I don't kind of like to hear your take on that on amyloid and, and also, uh, uh, this idea that, uh, an accumulation of micro strokes could be, could be the etiology, the root cause. So I think most of what we know now to me suggests that at least in the early stages, amyloid accumulation of amyloid plaque is an epiphenomenon of other things in the brain that are then actually driving the, the core disease process. There's enough evidence from, I think, animal models and some, some other um, arenas that says that if you have, once you have a very high amyloid burden, it can sort of, sort of damage neurons in this sort of feed forward process, but you probably need yeah. to develop quite a high plaque burden before that happens. Um, up until that point, it seems to be that amyloid accumulates as a response to neuronal stress. So it could be decreased. Like we know that if you don't sleep enough, amyloid accumulates because you're not clearing it out. Uh, but equally, um, inflammatory stimuli, uh, oxidative stress, infections, uh, you know, all of these things seem to drive an increase in, in amyloid um, production and, and accumulation. Yeah, yeah, the infection one is very interesting with uh, herpes simplex and Lyme disease. So. And uh, yeah. Pseudomonas gingivalis. So there's oh, yeah. like there's, there's a link yeah, to yeah. Um, uh, dental health. Um, yeah. And then there are also potentially heavy metals. And yeah. there's so, an idea that amyloid actually has antimicrobial uh, metal chelating yeah. <laughs> You know, kind of properties. So it's actually part of a protective response that that's happening. And I, I, you know, I don't think we can say that for certain, but I think it's certainly very interesting, and that comes from some ver from various arenas. So then, and again, assuming we're talking about the majority of Alzheimer's disease, which is sort of like late onset, heterogeneous, sporadic Alzheimer's disease. Um, most of the evidence says that it's really driven by lifestyle and the environment. And like the low end prediction is that at least 40% of cases, you know, could be prevented uh, with adequate changes of lifestyle and the environment. And my guess is it's probably higher than that. Yeah. So, you know, in, in the paper that we talked about earlier, we kind of, we have a, a figure that kind of ties together all these different parts of, you know, the, all these different risk factors. And I think, you know, micro thrombi is certainly one of them. Um, and, the way I think about it is kind of in like three broad buckets. So one is like a supply bucket and that's um, oxygen as well as glucose or ketones or lactate or whatever, you know, metabolic substrate you need plus <laughs> nutrients. And so they need to be available, but they also need to get to where they're going. So like there's the vascular yeah. health component as well as the nut nutrition component. Then there's demand itself, right? Is Are you even using that area of the brain so that it needs those things, right? We, we talked about yeah, demand earlier. Yeah. I think that's a critical component. And then there's also there's like a, a protection and rest and recovery component. So that's where sleep, chronic stress, toxic exposure comes. Are you like, are, are you put it, is the brain in an environment where it can adequately respond to stimuli, you know, maintain connections and, you know, su support, yeah. support growth or, you know, su support the connections that currently exist. And, and so neurotransmitter levels too. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's tied in with sleep and things like that. So yeah, with, acetylcholine yeah, so, has been a target. Yeah. Yeah. And can, um, you know, that's, the, that has a nutritional component, you know, but also some of the other things because, you know, a, a toxin may interfere with the, with those pathways. Yeah. So I, I think um, in my mind, the evidence suggests that even in the setting of suboptimal, you know, uh, cardiovascular health, suboptimal, you know, with some toxin exposures, high homocysteine levels, the brain can still respond and adapt to a stimulus. So in my mind, that still puts stimulus at like the top, but all the different risk factors, I think, fit into one of those buckets and help us understand like which part of the process is being affected. So yes, vascular health and vascular supply is critical because you need to get, you know, the, one of the key tenets of, healthy neuronal function is neurovascular coupling right the, yeah. the neuron fires it asks for more blood flow and metabolic substrate and oxygen to drive that process if you don't have a healthy cardiovascular system or vascular system it's that that can't happen um so that that, that has to be a critical part 
in in some like subset of people yeah okay yeah that that totally makes sense and i like the three buckets that you kind of put this in in a you know and it could come down to like just uh, a vitamin deficiency i know i mean i had a friend working in assisted living and and he would come in and have patients with Alzheimer's disease or early dementia uh, and just give them B12 shots. And mm-hmm. then they would be animated and talking kind of after that. Uh, another, another friend told me that he said, you know what, the biggest thing that I, and he told me this 20 years ago, uh, that a hot bath, like you would have to bathe the subjects. And he said, it was just like, if you could have a drug that would replicate the observable effects after giving these people a hot bath. And I always think back to that because that was, I mean, he told me that well over 20 years ago yeah. and it made me think, I was like, oh, well, that's, that's, well, you just feel better, but maybe it, it is increasing their circulation and mm. things like that, uh, which maybe I'd like to get, uh, I just watched uh, <laughs> Limitless, a movie with uh, Chris Helmsworth and, and Peter Thiel was in it too. Uh, but the, in, in the episode, he mentioned Alzheimer's disease, like a 50%, I have to fact check this. <laughs> But it was it was talking about sauna and something like a fifty percent decrease in Alzheimer's risk. Uh, and, and so I'd like to I need to dig up that study. But I would like to since we're on this topic, and I've been doing some like heat therapy stuff too. Uh, and for people out there, is this an actionable thing that they should consider? I mean, if they're apoe four positive, for example, should uh, are you familiar with the the research yeah. on this? Yeah. Was- so I'm. Uh- I think I'll, I'll lump the APOE4 people in with everybody else because I think the major driver, like regardless of your underlying genetics, is yeah, all yeah. these environmental factors. So, so I don't think for most people, I, I don't think it needs to be a concern as long as you're taking care of everything else. Yes. In, you know, overall. And for the um, record, I was going to go down that path and had a bunch of APOE4 questions, but it's like, hey, the things that we're talking about would just apply to everyone. And yeah. there's not something very specific to do for yeah. APOE. Yeah. Um, yeah. The risk is higher, but I think you, mit- you can mitigate most of that, if not all of the elevated risk with the stuff that we're talking about. Um, so, yeah, there's, um, it, it's, the, you know, there's several studies essentially from the same Finnish group looking at um, sauna um, sauna habits and then later cardiovascular disease, all-cause mortality, Alzheimer's disease risk. Yeah. And they find that, you know, regular sauna, I think it's three or four times a week, at least 20 minutes a time associated with, you know, significant decreases in all of those. Yeah. My, and I think there's a number of reasons why that may be the case. You know, I mean, uh, uh, there's the cardiovascular benefits. So it's so like, when you're very hot, it's one of the few times when your heart is, you have an increased cardiac output, but against a very low pressure system. Um, and so th- there's like potential benefits there. Plus, I-, I think, you know, there's benefits to sweating. It's one of our sort of detoxification yeah. um, mechanisms. And, you know, there's a social component to, to sauna usually in Finland, who, you know, who are sort of notorious for not being social, but it's generally, a, 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 a there's a social component. But so, so I think that, there is potentially an, uh, an effect there. I think the magnitude of the effect in the studies has to be incorrect. Like there's no, there's no way that just sauna decreases your risk of Alzheimer's disease by 50%. I, I, I don't believe that. Um, and that's probably because there's a certain type of person who has the money and time and resources to go to the sauna four times a week. Um, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that comes along the ride for that. So I'm very yeah. interested in sauna. I think there's a number of reasons why it may have those benefits. But I think the magnitude of the effect in the studies from that group are, are probably inflated. Yeah, I, I was th- I was kind of thinking of the mechanisms. And if you jump into the sauna, if you're in the sauna and you jump into the water, the ice bath or whatever they do there, I mean, it's just like exercising your vasculature, right? Mm-hmm. So it's just like vasodilation, vasocontraction, vasodilation, contraction. And, and I think... Yeah. And then the physical, uh, the effects on your sympathetic, parasympathetic, and then hormones too, may be a factor, but, yeah. um, nonetheless, it's got me interested uh, is something that I haven't really seriously considered in the past, mm-hmm. but that you can get almost the benefits of exercise that. So, uh, but, but I think, um, traditional dry sauna is where, where the, the evidence exists, like infrared saunas and stuff. I, I would be less convinced by, cause I think you need that. I think the heat stress is, is, is a part of it. Yeah. So that brings up an interesting question I actually had with Rhonda Patrick when I was at her house and she was showing me her 
sauna and then also the hot tub and some conversations I had with other people that I'm of the opinion that if you get into a hot tub or spa or whatever, whatever you call it, and I, I use a thermometer and I get my temperature up to 102 and then maintain it for 10 minutes and then I get out and then do the cold bath thing. Uh, this is like my protocol I've been working on. But I believe that it's, uh, and I'd like your take on this too, that hype, you know, exposing the brain to hypothermia may not be a very good idea. Whereas if you're in a hot tub, your core body temperature gets up, but you don't have that direct exposure of your head to the heat. And I heard some scientists talk about this, that it could be potentially damaging when you're, you know, getting into a 190 degree dry sauna and that they were talking about a safer approach would just be to get into a hot tub up to your neck, get your body temperature. It's, you know, it's really bringing your core temperature up to, they were saying about 102, but I know when you exercise really intensely in the heat, you can Mm. elevate that to 104 and maintain that for like an hour. Some people do that, but I, but I think the threshold is like, a hundred, you know, 101 to 102 and then maintain that for 10 minutes. So this is, and it made a lot of sense when I heard them talking about it. And then I talked to Rhonda Patrick about it and she had some conversations, you know, uh, along these lines too, that, you know, exposing your head directly to hypothermia may not be the best thing, especially people are really pushing sauna really high temperatures. So I'd like to get your, your thoughts on that. <laughs> so, so in, in the, in this, in, in like a setting that I've studied in several different ways in the lab, after after a brain injury, you know, particularly in the acute setting, having a, a hot brain is very bad. Don't yes. do that. Yes. Um, in so like the setting that you're you're talking about, to be fair, I'm I'm less concerned, and the reason is that the heat of the brain is driven by the heat of the blood that's coming from the carotid arteries as it goes into the deep brain and outwards. So if your core temperature temperature is 102, your brain is going to be that temperature because it's really regulated by the the temperature of the blood coming up into the deep brain. So I'm not worried about, I don't think the external effect is as much as some people would, would say. Yeah. But there's a couple, like one or two degree differential there. And that could, potentially be. But I, I think the more important question, but if you're in a hot tub and you got your core temperature to 102, then that's essentially replicating the same effect, you know, from, from sauna. But I know all the, all the studies have been in a dry sauna, but I get oh, this question yeah. a lot. So, so yeah. I think that the effects are probably similar. What I'm and, and I agree, but I, I, I can't think of a good reason why having you know, your head in a 200 degree dry sauna while the rest of your body temperature is also increasing, why that would be worse for the brain. I I can't, I I, I don't find that particularly convincing. I I think, but I agree that the effect of getting core temperature up in a hot tub is probably similar, but I'm not necessarily concerned about the the temperature around the head as much because like the the effect is just, is just relatively going to be much less than you know, the, the, the core temperature that's, that's driving the majority of brain temperature. Yeah. I, I kind of, okay. I agree with that too. And and if it was a factor, we would see it in, right. And the people that, yeah. Yeah, that exactly. use sauna, uh, yeah. but I think uh, another option for people who don't have a sauna could just be like a hot bath or a hot tub. Yeah. Uh, I think they could replicate the same thing. And they've done so, some, they've done some studies in individuals with type two diabetes and just putting uh-huh. them in a hot tub or a hot bath actually improves uh, glycemic c- glycemic control and that's probably partly improving circulation you know improving increasing demand it, then as you like sort of try and offload the temperature so yeah so yes there seems to be some benefits even just from a hot bath okay yeah i have a a, a dexcom on but it also happened with the abbott libre device is that glucose goes way up uh but i think that there's an enzymatic reaction in the in the sensor that and that actually increases the kinetics of the reaction for the for the glucose uh and then when i jump into the cold i mean i see it just goes up and then comes down and then as soon as i get out of the cold bath it starts pinging me that you're 40 you know uh (laughs) but i think that's that's impact i think these things are are set to work at a certain temperature ideally body temperature so uh i have many more questions but the last question i I want well i have just a few other personal questions too but supplements so i just want to hit on that topic really quick you know, I, I think you're of the opinion too, that supplements are not necessarily needed. Maybe if you don't eat any fish, uh, omega-3 supplement could be helpful, Mm. but the, 
things that I take, you know, omega three, if I'm not eating fish, but vitamin D, magnesium, creatine, uh, monohydrate seems to have a lot of good data behind it, even from a neuro neurological perspective. But uh, so those are kind of the ones I take and just want to get your opinion on that. But also there's a lot of buzz about, uh, and we're gravitating to doing research on this topic for NAD supplements. So, you know, quick thoughts on that and where the state of the science is and you think, think it's worth your uh, people spending money on this. So your, your core list is essentially the same as mine. Um, okay. I think, and like that, that, that's why yeah. I think everybody with a brain should take creatine. Um, yeah. It just seems to be like this magical yeah. thing that does everything for the brain as well as for performance and has, as far as I can tell, like zero downsides other than it yeah. increases your creatinine. Um, which I've is seen one, that on yeah. blood work. Yeah. Taking it since 1992 when it was like super expensive when it first came yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> um, you don't need to cycle it. Like you just yeah. take it continuously. Um, it, so from a cognitive uh, performance or health standpoint, two other or well, one sort of like broad group of things i'm interested in is um polyphenols particularly okay. uh anthocyanins from blueberries and then um uh, flavonols from cocoa uh and actually there's there's nice data on both and you can probably get mm. enough if you just eat uh, a big handful of wild blueberries every day yeah um but there's a for the cocoa flavonol uh, standpoint and that they actually have some trials in cardiovascular health as well um uh, there's a, a coca via is, is a company that makes makes a, a supplement called memory plus um and a lot of the benefit you know, may act like through modulating the gut microbiota but it seems to affect nitric oxide production so again it's like a, it's improving vascular health which is then um improving uh, brain health there may also be some it's only been done in animal studies but there may also be some direct effect of the anthocyanins on like inflammation in the brain but that's i, I don't have good human it's data to, to say yeah. that that's the case um then uh then the, the other thing that you you asked about was nad supplements um i'm you know i think declining nad is an interesting thing um as part of the aging process i'm more interested in why nad decreases rather than supplementing it to 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 replace it and so things that are important are so we know that Chronic stress and chronic inflammation divert tryptophan away from the kinurin and pathway, which then you know yep. makes NAD in the first place. We know that NAD is used up uh, in order to repair DNA damage through the PARP1 yep. uh, pathway, right? So you know if you make you know, have adequate nutrient intake and you do you know improve things that allow that pathway to function normally, and you're not increasing the, like the, de the depletion of NAD. And um, the recycling of NAD happens during sleep through NAMPT. So like, if you do all the things that we know are important from a health and lifestyle, uh, uh, you know, for fa those factors, I, I think you're managing your NAD really well. Um, and there's little from, you know, my experience that says that an NAD supplement is going to help that. Um, I, you know, there's been some recent talk about certain studies that show that there was a nicotinamide riboside uh supplement increased uh you know can uh, cancer in an animal model of cancer or the yeah. in, in these models like the animals are seeded with cancer and, and right so they have cancer to start with and then they give them yeah. a supplement. um i'm not really sure how relevant that is to humans so I, i'm not really worried about the risks other than to your wallet um so i i, I I'm not sure there's a huge amount for for most people. It's not something that I think needs to be supplemented. And I think you can take care of your NAD system by, you know, improving all the standard stuff that we've already talked about. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and real quick is it, it gets a lot of attention too. It's like, do you think of any supplements that could improve or optimize your hormone levels like Tonga Ali or ashwagandha, uh, or things that could potentially like lower uh, cortisol, rhodiola, I think is one of them. I mean, are, do you, are, are these in your toolbox with, with yeah. people or patients use? Yeah, so actually I like some of the adaptogens. I think uh, ashwagandha is, is the best studied and particularly the KSM 66 extract. Like that's what, that's what I'd take. Um, and, you know, people who are chronically stressed, I think there's, 
there's uh, some evidence of, of benefit there, and I've certainly certainly have you have, have, have used that um, from uh, so like rhodiola potentially fits in that bucket as well. Although I think that there's less there's less evidence. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff about like phosphatidyl serine uh, supposedly decreases cortisol, um, but what's interesting is that the original studies of phosphatidyl serine used a a bovine brain derived phosphatidyl serine and that seems to decrease mm. cortisol levels they haven't replicated those results as much in the plant derived or i think it's less lecithin derived phosphatidyl serine so is it the phosphatidyl yeah. serine or is it whatever else was in that cow brain supplement that came along for the ride i'm not sure so phosphatidyl serine i'm less certain about the evidence with the, like the modern forms because you can't make it out of cow brains anymore yeah um and so, so, so I think that there is um, a little bit uh, there. Was there another one that you asked about? Uh, I think that covers most of it. And oh, one more question: like, so supplements in the context of a plant-based diet or vegetarian vegan diet uh, is something that I get quite of. Uh, the yesterday I got a, a, an email about this or question. So, would you change your recommendations on uh, essential supplements or necessary supplements for those? So, the omega threes come up. I actually use uh, spirulina. Uh, Energy Bits is the product that I use, uh, and that has a pretty high dose if you take enough of it of a, of a non. Uh, animal source of, you know, omega-3. So I would gravitate to that. And of course, things like, you know, B12. Uh, but uh, other than that, do you think uh, the plant-based diet presents any particular problems that would need to be mitigated through supplementation? Um, not necessarily, uh, as long as people are sort of doing the same tests that we've already talked about. Um, yeah. I, I think there is, you know, all the best people that I know in the plant-based arena will recommend you take um, like a, a methylated B12 supplement. And I, I would agree with that. There's just no, there's no way around that on a plant-based diet. Yeah. Most other nutrients you could probably get. Um, so, uh, you know, an algal DHA source I think is worth considering, but you know, you could test your omega-3 index first, you know, if it's fine, don't worry about it. Um, so I, yeah. I think testing before just saying somebody on a plant-based diet needs to supplement. I, I think that's important. So homocysteine, something you could measure uh, as well as, you know, you can see um, a B12 requirement. You can do something called a methyl malonic acid test, or you can just look at mean corpuscular volume on your CBC. If that's elevated, it may be due to uh, a B12 insufficiency or deficiency. So just do some testing uh, first, but Otherwise, there's nothing that I say that I would think that you really would need to get. I would recommend creatine because obviously you won't get any of that yeah, if you're not eating point. meat. Yep. Um, but other than that, uh, th there's nothing that I'd say you would just have to. As long as calories are adequate and protein is adequate, uh, I yep. think you, know, you okay. can be just fine. Jumping real quick to the other end of the spectrum, carnivore. Does a carnivore, does that need to uh, supplement with anything? Vitamin C comes to mind. I know there's some debate going on there a little bit, but I think maybe not an issue with organ meat or fresh meat or something like that. But I, I see this. I see people who are plant-based posting about, you know, that people following carnivore are going to be deficient in vitamin C and that there's going to be scurvy problem <laughs> in the future. So, so uh, what, what I know several people that? who I've know several people who've been carnival for several years and clearly have no evidence of scurvy yeah. or vitamin C okay. deficiency. I think so that's, that's the quick, that's the quick answer in general, okay. what we think we need in terms of vitamin C is probably again, the, the, the original, studies on nutrient requirements are just like heavily skewed by the population they were done in so yeah it's possible i mean possible absolutely possible but i've certainly i certainly know people where that doesn't seem to be the case okay if it was a case then we would start seeing yeah cases yeah. come up uh well tommy thanks so much for your time and i just want to kind of end with uh, a, a personal question like what is your training i'm very interested in like uh, a, a quick summary of your training and kind of what an average meal would be for you. And if you don't mind, uh, because we had an exchange a while back and you had been bitten by a viper, maybe exchange <laughs> how that happened quickly and, and how you mitigate, mitigated that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, sure. So, um, I was on a, what was it at the time, a company retreat in Costa Rica, mm -hmm. in the Costa Rican jungle, and I was bitten by a, a fair lance, uh, it was a pit, pit viper. 
Um, and I spent Pit Piper, yeah, yeah, I spent eleven days in hospital oh, in Costa Rica. Shit. My wife had to fly out and come and come and get me. I had um, I had an abscess in in my leg uh, that had to be that had to be drained. It was essentially drained without um, this sort of like sliced over my leg without really any local anesthetic, or because they injected local anesthetic, um, but it just didn't give enough time for it to kick in. So they kind of drained the, all this pus out of my leg, uh, and apparently that, that that's very normal. When I first went in, they were like, there's two problems. The, the first problem is the venom, which can cause blood clotting issues. And the second problem is the infection, to which I thought, oh, maybe I'll get an infection. But no, you always get an infection because um, that's part. Of, that's actually part of how, like, if the venom doesn't get you, the infection will. Um, wow. that's part, like, it's like a symbiotic relationship between the snake and the, the bacteria <laughs> in the venom sacs, which is interesting. Um so and then I, I, you know, the the first antibiotics they they gave me didn't work, and then um, I got serum sickness, which is a response to the anti venom. So I just had this, like I was in like in full hives, you know, having this big like inflammatory reaction oh. to to the anti venoms. So they had to give me like uh, intravenous uh, steroids and antihistamines and all this kind of stuff. Um, but the yeah. what the the funny or one of the things that kind of relates to what we talked about is they almost didn't. Um, discharge me because my cre my creatinine was higher than they expected and that's because yeah. i have a i have a higher muscle mass and i take creatine but they thought my kidneys were failing um which is why so uh -huh. it's just a this is why cre uh, i think creatinine is, is a bad marker in in athletes or people wow. who suffer so it wasn't like astronomically high it was just like border range high and they no, it they was were... like it was like one point it was like 1.2 or something yeah um and so like just it was above the normal range but yeah. Well, wow. when, when you got bit at that point in time, did you know it was a pit viper and did you know that you're in problem, going to have a problem? And how did you, did you, so we found, like we found out, different? yeah. So we found out half, half the way. So I got bit, I was with my, my good friend and, and colleague, Ben, Ben house, um, or we weren't good friends and colleagues then, but he essentially saved my life and we've become, uh, you know, very close since, um, but we sort of decided like we'd rather be the silly gringos um, in the ER, not worrying about it, you know, worrying about something yeah. that wasn't worth worrying about rather than, you know, something worse happens. So we were on the way to the hospital, which is like driving down a mountain road and then, you know, drive, driving out to the, to the hospital. And um, the, 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 the manager of the site uh, went back, found the snake and killed it so that we would know what type of snake it was. And so, so like halfway through the drive, um, uh, Ben gets this text um, and I can feel the van accelerating right. <laughs> as he figures, as he finds out what type of snake it was. Um, so, so yeah, we, we, and, and that, that helped. And then, you know, the, the main doctor who looked after me, he treated like a thousand of these snake bites or something. So, wow. I mean, and, the Costa Rican healthcare system is actually, I mean, it's a nationalized healthcare system. You get what you need. It's not fancy, but they, they do, they did a great job. And they, re, like, yeah. even though this was a small rural hospital, like, you know, it was, I really appreciated everything they did because it was, it was great. It was exactly what, what I needed. They knew what they were doing. Wow. That's a hell of a story, <laughs> man. So you're lucky. Did it bite through pants or did it, did you have no, shorts No, I was on? wearing shorts. Yeah. Shorts? So okay. it was just about, just above the ankle. Yeah. Yeah. Oof. Okay. So man, uh, well, I'm curious, that was a heck of a story. <laughs> what, what your, uh, I know you're, I mean, you've been in the training strongman and do a variety of physical feats and activities, what your current, how you manage your current training with your current academic load and, and sort of a brief, uh, do you do intermittent fasting? That was a question I had and, and what your diet is like. So I don't do intermittent fasting. Um, I do time restricted eating, but not intermittent fasting. So my eating window is yeah. like nine to 10 hours a day. So I usually won't eat between six or 7 PM and then nine or 10 AM the next day. That's my normal eating window. Um, and then, yeah, so I have, I have a coach, Dr. Mike T. Nelson. Um, oh, yeah. some people may, my, yeah. may know of he's, he's Love my coach. Mike. Great. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And, um, he, so, so he programs for me for strongman and I compete like once a year on average. Um, but so I, I lift, uh, four days a week and then two days a week, I just do like some, some cardio type stuff. So right now it's, I throw on a weight vest and I crank up the, the incline on the treadmill and I just like walk. Uh, so this is essentially kind yeah. of like rocking. That's what I do for my cardio. And then 
uh, getting close to the event, I'll do more sp- sprint training because because strongman's like the maximum often yeah. like the maximum you do in sixty or ninety seconds. So I'll do a lot of like rowing sprints on on the yeah. on the rowing machine. Awesome. Well, yeah, that's like the best combination I can think yeah. of. And, it covers um, it covers everything. So I, yeah. I, I think it's actually quite you know almost quote unquote functional and it's fun it's 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 more like varied than say powerlifting training or bodybuilding training so i I like that i guess a bit of everything yeah keeping it fun yeah that's an important thing engaged in it (laughs) well tommy thanks so much for your time and uh oh yeah last question like where uh can people find you do you have like particular website or kind of are you on social media i think we're connected but i'm not sure yeah, <laughs> yeah um i definitely follow you on instagram i know that okay. um yeah so instagram is probably okay. the best place to find me at dr tommy wood um and uh i i'm pretty good at answering messages so if anybody has any questions based on anything we've talked about feel free to reach out and I'll, I'll make sure to get back to you awesome well thanks again tommy for this incredible interview that was like super dense the longest by far <laughs> that we've had in this series uh through the metabolic link podcast and really appreciate it and look forward to having you back on again and also as a speaker for metabolic health summit yeah i look forward to being back like i said it was um, a, r- a really great event and uh can't can't wait to the next one thanks for tuning in to this episode of the metabolic link if you've enjoyed this podcast please share it with others leave a comment leave a review And also follow us on social media at Metabolic Health Summit. We look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.